Welcome to the MSDW Podcast. I'm Jason Gumpert, editor at MSDNMXWorld.com. Today, we talk with Steve Mordew, founder of Rapid Start CRM and Forceworks, and the newly awarded at Microsoft MVP. Steve has a unique view on Microsoft's SMB CRM plans related to Dynamics 365 Business Edition, and he doesn't shy away from speaking his mind on what the future will hold. In short, he's optimistic about the SMB offering, something he probably wouldn't have said a few months ago. And partners still have plenty of challenges to face down with their Dynamics 365, including market pressures and, as always, adoption. So let's go. Hey, Steve Mordew, welcome to the podcast. Hey, Jason. Glad to be back. Yeah, glad to have you. I think I should start out first by just mentioning that today is uh, March 1st, 2017, and you are now uh, officially a Microsoft MVP, so congratulations on that award. Oh, thanks. Yeah, I'm really excited about that, to join that prestigious group of MVPs that I've been envying for all these years. Yeah, it is a great group, and it's one of, I think the best uh, programs that Microsoft runs for its partner community. Really, uh, it never ceases to uh, give great people kind of unique access, from what I can tell, to uh, to things that, that really do help them you know, be great professionals in w- whatever area they're in. Yeah, it looks like it. I know quite a few of the MVPs. I've known them for years. And uh, yeah, so I'm glad to, to finally have uh, kind of jumped into that pool with those guys and, and gals. <laughs> From an outsider's perspective, it's always nice to see people who you you know and whose work you've been following become MVPs. And typically, that you know, so I I know a lot of the work you've been doing with uh, with the Partner Channel, and you know, obviously your own blogging and doing things like this and writing articles. And you know, so it's it's always really good to see um, people who who deserve it. And there was there was you, and, and there was another person who who actually on the CRM side who actually didn't get CRM sort of. MVP status for CRM in particular is Stefano Tempesta, but he's also very, very involved in the CRM community um, as a customer, actually, uh, which is a little more unique. But, uh, but yeah, so at least at least a couple of CRM sort of focused people who got recognition today. And uh, there's that new uh, sort of monthly recognition, which is nice. I think that'll sort of kind of loosen up the loosen up the program a little bit in the sense of making it a little more interesting to follow month. Yeah, yeah, I think so. So now that I'm an MVP, people have to go back and reread all of my blog posts with more credibility. <laughs> See what they were missing if they didn't, if they weren't yeah. already following it. It was just kind of writing to, all this stuff. Yeah, and, and you know, you certainly haven't slowed down with your blogging. I mean, you've been very active in the month, looking back on the month of February with a, a range of, I guess it kind of shows for me anyway, where your head is at or where you're, what kind of challenges you're, you're thinking about these days, huh? You know, it's funny. I, I think that, Most of my blog posts come out of something that is occurring, you know, with us, you know, so something has happened during the week. The last post I wrote about, uh, you know, Salesforce ISVs popping up as a direct result of Salesforce ISVs popping up with us. And, you know, so really trying to focus on what we're doing and the challenges that we're facing, uh, working on things like app source and different things like that, the new SMB apps and our focus on that. So usually I've got stuff to write about, but not always. Sometimes, as you know, as a, somebody who writes for a living, sometimes you can sit there. I, I usually like to write blog posts on Sunday morning. It's a good opportunity. I'll go out on the back porch. Mm-hmm. It's quiet. And uh, every now and then you'll go sit down and nothing, nothing pops up. No ideas. <laughs> so so you'll, sure. see, you'll see spurts there where there's a, a week or two and I haven't written anything. And then all of a sudden I'll blast out like five things in a week, just a whole bunch of stuff happening. So it's very much... Uh, you know, in the moment of uh, stuff that's going on. But, you know, I, I enjoy doing it. I've gotten a lot of good feedback uh, from it. I've, you know, I've tried to avoid the technical posts uh, and focus more on, you know, ideas and concepts and stuff. And yeah, it's been fun. You know, I think it's also a, a really great sign to see someone like you getting MVP status when you're also extremely candid about, like you said, things that aren't just technical or aren't just sort of directly product feature focused or development focused you know and, and it's certainly not the first mvp to have been able to share an opinion and still sort of but it's, it's just it's really nice to see i think maybe maybe this is a credit to microsoft as much as you that they're willing to sort of open it up to people who are looking to have real dialogue you know i think there is a way to be critical without sounding like a, a jerk and also acknowledging that you know things are where they are but they're not going to stay here so you know you can complain about some things that might be occurring right now but you know that you know microsoft's listening you know they're working on these things and and very often you know my posts will start out you know talking about something kind of negative but they usually end up on a high note and i think that's the that's the key i could i could imagine actually i can see from my analytics uh, my most of my reads of our my posts come from inside of microsoft which uh-huh. is uh 
interesting and, and, and a little scary <laughs> to think that uh, when you're writing something that the largest number of readers are going to come from the company you're writing about. But I, I have not gotten anybody uh, reaching out with any complaints you know, from Microsoft that I've you know, flown too close to the sun on anything. And I try and avoid NDA stuff you know, because you know, that's important if you want to stay on the inside and get the information. You can't go blabbing your face about it. And uh, as much as you might like to, you, know, you just have to kind of sit back and talk around the edges. Yeah. yeah, well, I can confirm that. I mean, there, Microsoft does let people know when they do fly a little too close to the sun. I've worked with people who thought they were sort of well within what they could say, and then they came back and said, "Nope, that was not uh, <laughs> that was not what I was supposed to say or what I was allowed to say." And um, it does happen from time to time. So you're, you're right to you're right to be wary of that. I would just I would just yeah, say. I think, I, I think usually it's pretty obvious if you're trying to write too hard and trying too hard to get people to read, then. Uh, you know, you may be tempted to drop some stuff yeah. out there that you know is, uh, you know, uh, NDA. And, you know, those those folks find themselves kind of out of the circle pretty quickly. Yeah, I think we can both think of, of cases where that's happened. But, yeah, so, I mean, that, you know, again, candid and just looking at the, um, you know, I've got to think I've been noticing, you know, more comments, more sort of, it looks, I need to my, to my eye, not really evaluating it too closely, more maybe more social media shares, um, all sorts of good stuff for, for the kinds of uh, kinds of materials you're sharing that you're putting out there, which is cool. I'm going to keep it up. I think that, you know, ever since the launch of Dynamics 365 or yeah. the, lead, the lead up to it really is when I kind of got reinvigorated around blogging. And there was so much stuff uh, to write about, so much to speculate about. And it hasn't really let up. There's still... You know, there's still significant confusion in the marketplace around, you know, what it is, the the licensing. It's a pretty complicated thing to get your arms around. Uh, you really have to kind of study it. And uh, I think that's been a challenge, particularly for non-CRM partners that Microsoft would like to lure into the camp with Dynamics 365. You know, it just it still feels very foreign. I think Microsoft has a few steps to go to make that message clearer to partners uh, you know, when you look at the the price list for Dynamics 365, I don't know it's like 100 SKUs on there. I mean, it's just, it's just, it's a lot of stuff to try and understand. What am I selling my this customer? You know, what what should huh. they be buying? That's interesting. I I'll have to maybe uh, go back and think about that tomorrow because you know I think of the SKUs for Dynamics 365, maybe like you know the sort of picture that's presented. There shouldn't be that many SKUs. Well, you know, when you think about, it, you've got a SKU for each app. And then you've, yeah. got a, then you've got a SKU for the plan, and, yeah. th and that's at the enterprise. Then you've got transitional SKUs, which is for people that are currently yeah. on the old program, uh, paying the old price to kind of step them to the new plans and pricing. So there's a whole raft of SKUs there, depending on where you're coming from. And then uh, because we don't have the SMB apps yet, we've got these uh, promotional SKUs for SMB to buy the enterprise apps at the SMB pricing until, right. until those launch out there. So there's a lot of SKUs related to this, you know, compared to before Dynamics 365 when we really only had three or four. Oh, okay. Yeah. I guess once you put in in all the, the transitional and promotional ones, I could certainly see that. And, you know, the promotional is one of the areas where, you know, what I'm taking away from the Dynamics 365, you know, situation right now is that there's a ton of buzz or you know, energy. It sounds like partners are seeing a lot of interest right now in 365 and that the challenge is that there are these complexities or sort of gray boxes that are marked TBD right now that they just can't. It's like they're sort of trying to hold on to this you know, energy and, and sort of incoming uh, interest uh, until Microsoft can like pull the full Sweet together to give them the sort of the full story that they can just put on the table for for new prospects. Yeah, I, I would say the the success for Microsoft with the launch of Dynamics 365 and the noise that it made was there's lots of new partners that are now genuinely interested mm -hmm. uh, that, that weren't before that uh, were really just kind of ignoring uh, the whole business uh, solutions side. So there's a lot of interest now uh, and a lot of partners asking about it, a lot of partners wanting to maybe go down that route. I think it's a combination of the timing of Dynamics 365 launching and all the noise around it. And also with those traditional you know, partners that have been selling Office 365, uh, not, not necessarily that the market is saturated, but there's a lot of companies selling Office 365 now, so margins are getting compressed. 
Azure similarly has been very popular with those partners as a next step. And I think they're starting to feel some similar compression there from competition. So, you know, they're looking for what's next. And right as they all start thinking about what's next, here comes all the noise about Dynamics 365. So I think it was a you know, kind of a perfect storm from an interest standpoint. But mm-hmm. uh Yeah, when they step in and take a look closer at Dynamics 365 and try and get their arms around it, I think they're still struggling a little bit with what it is, how to sell it, uh, you know, what do I buy, how do I get it provisioned, what do I do? do? Uh, They haven't lost interest. They haven't just, uh, it's not like they came over, took a peek over the fence and then went on their way. Their head is still hanging over the fence. Yeah, I mean, hopefully, I guess for for Microsoft's perspective, hopefully it it stays that way until... uh, until they can really get this thing fully in, in motion. I mean, certain parts of it are. And I, I wanted to ask you about maybe one of the uh, sort of slightly different types of interest, and that's something you covered recently, which was you know, interest in Dynamics 365, or I guess interest in AppSource and selling add-ons in the Microsoft realm by Salesforce ISVs. This caught my attention. I mentioned it in something I wrote uh, recently because uh, it sort of struck me as a, a bit of a signal, uh, maybe an early signal of things to come in the you know the uh, the role of 365 in the in the marketplace. Um, can you talk a little more about what you've been seeing and maybe what you took from it? Yeah, I mean, I think that what I took from it really was some uh, some legitimacy. You know, Salesforce, obviously the 800 pound gorilla. Uh, we were Salesforce partners for 10 years before we moved over to Microsoft about six years ago. So we're pretty comfortable with both sides, understand both platforms, and a lot of Salesforce's success was with App Exchange, which is their marketplace for third-party you know, ISV solutions. And they were able to really, in many cases, there were some pretty big ISV solutions that really just transformed a Salesforce deployment into something completely different uh, to where many users were not even aware they were using Salesforce. Uh, these ISVs established their own branding, were out there selling and promoting their solution as a total solution, just happened to include a Salesforce license underneath. And with Microsoft, on the Dynamics side, it doesn't seem like we'd really gotten to that point. You know, we've got AppSource and there's lots of widgets and some things in there, but it's it's pretty clear they are add-ons to a big product of Dynamics as opposed to into Salesforce. They, they kind of got past that with those folks where, you know, Salesforce was kind of taking the back seat. And I think mm-hmm. that uh, that's a goal uh, or a hope of, of Microsoft with AppSource is that, you know, there are some significant uh, solutions in there. Bringing over, you know, Ron Huddleston from Salesforce, you know, he was uh, the guy behind App Exchange over there and its success. And maybe it was a combination of him coming over, Dynamics 365 launching, but recently we've had a spate of Salesforce ISVs. Because I think if you search for Salesforce and Dynamics together in the same sentence, we come up pretty high. Uh, just reaching out to us asking about. Uh, you know, we've got this uh, Salesforce application has been very successful, hadn't really paid any attention to Dynamics, but suddenly we're thinking we should. And, you know, as a Salesforce ISV, uh, it would make sense. You know, you're, you've got all this domain knowledge, you've built an application around it, but you've only made it available in one platform. And, you know, it's kind of like the phone app developers. You know, you got a great iPhone uh, app, so of course you're going to put it on Android. But no, they didn't really pay attention to Windows Phone. And had Windows Phone gotten more traction than they would have, well, that's kind of where we're at with Dynamics. It's kind of getting the traction that those ISVs are thinking, you know, we need a version for that platform too. Uh, very exciting for us. I think it's very exciting for Microsoft and great for the customers. Yeah, Microsoft's done some uh, fairly high-profile partnerships where they've sort of embraced a, a, an ISV, usually a larger one, that started in the Salesforce realm, and they've done some kind of a partnership to try to nurture, you know, their launch of a CRM, you know, a Dynamics compatible version of their of their solution in conjunction with with Microsoft and kind of bringing them in with some visibility and so forth. And I wonder if that's helped get any of the other, maybe the smaller ISVs or more, some, anyone who's maybe a little more niche uh, to also pay attention. You know, it could be. I mean, obviously, you know, Salesforce is a similar platform going after a similar customer for similar needs. Uh, you know, lots of technical differences between what those two platforms are and how they accomplish those goals, but very similar goals. So, you know, if I'm Microsoft standing back looking at, uh, you know, what what should we be pursuing that would be successful? You know, I've kind of got a model I can go look at and see what's working for Salesforce. And things like, you know, you mentioned probably talking about things like uh, insights from inside mm-hmm. view. You know, that sort of uh, functionality obviously has been successful at Salesforce. It's something customers want. 
So it was pretty easy for Microsoft to just say, oh, well, there's something. So, you know, I, I think Microsoft is doing a good job of kind of walking the balance between what is Salesforce doing that's successful? Let's bring that kind of capability here, but also let's continue to focus on areas where we can be completely unique from Salesforce and let them try and catch us. So we're kind of getting in that, that little game now, the recent, you know, Salesforce announcements about AI, you know, that has to have all come from knowing that Microsoft is pretty deep in that side. Sure. So, yeah, so I think they're in a the process of kind of stealing from each other. Yeah, I mean, a lot of the a lot of the time when I hear roadmap updates from really either company, I'm trying to think to myself, now who's trying to play catch up on that particular? Because you get the sense that they're pushing features out very, very quickly to try to either beat the other one to market or just to to match them if it's something that the other the other side got got out yeah. first, even if it's something that the, most of their customers won't take advantage of for two, three, four years. And also shaking out the hype, you know. I mean, it's. Uh, yep. Uh, I think that a lot of the Einstein talk is there's a lot of hype there. That's a lot of cobbled together, uh, recent acquisitions put together, and they're they're, they're standing that up uh, as though it's on par with what Microsoft has in Azure, which is you know just night and day between those two. So, and I'm sure the reverse is true too of some things Microsoft may be maybe hyping up that Salesforce does better. So it's kind of shaking through what. You know, what's real and what's hype? And you know, the unfortunate thing is the end customer is the one who has to try and figure this out, and they're not always uh, in a position to, to do it. Mm -hmm. Getting back to App Source, there's so much. I think you might have mentioned this at, at one point too. There's so much sort of left to be done with it. It right now pretty much represents, as far as I, last updates I've seen, it, it still pretty much represents a, a directory, you know, a, a lead gen mechanism for, for vendors, but it doesn't have, as far as I can tell, really great support. For, well, it doesn't have great support for some of the things you can imagine it becoming in the future in terms of supporting sort of, like you said, broader solutions that just, I mean, I guess in the case of Dynamics, you're maybe like sort of, you know, XRM-based solutions or, or offering, uh, I don't know, sort of management of apps within it. Um, I'm sure there's probably some other area, big areas that you might be looking for as well. Yeah, is you know, fair when, to say? Well, when you think about a, a solution that really is not even a year old that that came up with, you know, Microsoft has had marketplaces before, uh, yeah. kind of kind of scattered around lots of different marketplaces, and and again, I think there were there were too many of them. They weren't easy to find, and so they didn't really get a lot of traction. But uh, AppSource, you know, my understanding is uh, that was Scott Guthrie's, uh, you know, behind that one. And they're really consolidating a lot of these other motions into really these two. You know, there's AppSource and then there's the Azure Marketplace. Mm -hmm. So really focusing those efforts in those two areas. And, and you know, they surface everywhere. You know, if you're in Office, uh, if you're in Dynamics, uh, if you're in Power BI, you know, AppSource is a click away. So as an ISV, you can't afford to not be there because, you know, Microsoft is shoving that right in front of end customers' faces. You, you have to have your stuff there. But, yeah, it's, it's early days. They've got a pretty big roadmap for AppSource. Right now, essentially, it's just a tube straight into a customer's tenant. So you can you can load up some, uh, some IP uh, in there, and it'll just push it into that customer's tenant for you. And for simple to deploy user configurable IP, you know, that works just fine. But some of these more complex applications, th there's going to be more involved in configuration than an end user might be able to do successfully. There's no part of AppSource that manages a trial experience that like turns it off after 30 days. You've got to build that into your app. There's no billing mechanism for, you know, billing that customer or charging you know, per tenant, per user, or any of those sorts of things that as an app you're going to need to do. So they're looking at those things coming. And they got a good team on it that's working really hard on it, very receptive. You know, I think when they first opened that up, the door was pretty wide open. Just about any app you'd throw in there would get in there because, you know, you need to get some scale. Now, you know, most recent thing I'd heard was there's about a thousand apps in the backlog. That's pretty huge. Uh, yeah, they're going <laughs> it doesn't through. surprise me, but yeah, I believe it. Yeah, and I, and I think that that gives Microsoft the luxury of raising the bar on the quality of those apps. Uh, I would have no doubt they're going to go back and maybe look at the ones that were already, you know, released early to see if they meet the new bar that they're able to uh, to have. And I think the quality of apps in there, uh, not, that it's, not that it's bad, but uh, it's going to be good and it's going to get better. Uh, and, you know, the more interest they have, uh, this is probably the most interest they've had in any, you know, third-party app effort that they've tried. So, so they got a good opportunity with it, and and a good roadmap for you know giving more capabilities to to ISVs to be able to do more stuff. 
yeah, I'm, I'm interested to see where the balance is going to be between, you know, building more and more features to do with some of the things you talked about, deploying more sophisticated, you know, solutions, billing, you know, management of trials uh, versus just trying to get a groundswell of support among the partner channel to say, hey, we can, you know, maybe we don't need it to be all these features, but it can just become a place where we are sort of a stepping stone for us to get more of our customers into the product and signed up. And even if we still do it through more traditional means that, that the app source model, you know, gets them paying attention and gets them engaged as opposed to being feature rich. Yeah. I, I, well, I talked to the team just about two weeks ago because we've got some IP that really is a little more elaborate than what could go in, uh, you know, a customer self-deployment, but sure. you know, we, we'd like to have that, you know, available, have customers see it. But we wouldn't want to have them try and do it themselves. And I think there's a lot of partners that have that kind of IP. I was just talking with a team a couple of weeks ago about different ideas. So they're, they're definitely trying to figure out the best way to do that because they know they've created a front door. They don't want to leave partners, you know, with IP like ours, you know, out on the curb. But by the same token, you know, they, they're wanting to have this be a customer first experience. So it's really just trying to find that balance. You know, mm-hmm. may, maybe at some point there'll be an app source apps that you can just push a button and install yourself and another area for more sophisticated or complex apps where you can just learn about them and then contact the partner for help or something. You know, they're, but they're, they're definitely chewing on that, trying to figure out the best way to, to deal with that. They weren't earlier. I mean, earlier they were hearing me and others probably talk about that with the idea that we'll get back to that. Because right now uh, we're, you know, working very hard on, on volume and, and lots of widgets, lots of widgets. But they they have known yeah. in the back of their minds that there was going to need to be more sophisticated uh, solutions available through there and that they were going to have to accommodate that. So they're definitely thinking about it. And now I'm hearing more talk about it. Uh, I wanted to ask you about, I guess, demos and demo strategy, um, something you have been thinking about recently. How does that tie in with what you do on a daily basis? Because you're, I mean, you're primarily an ISV, right? In, yeah, in, 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 in we, we are. Uh, you know, we do lots of demos for our partners. Uh, you know, in order in order for a partner to you know want to sign up and resell our solutions, they need to understand them. So we do lots of demos for our partners. Uh, we have done lots of customer demos in the past, and I, I've just sat through so many horrible demos. And I think that you know, I can, I can remember when we first moved over to Microsoft bragging about us having a 75 or 80 percent close ratio without ever demoing a product and it was really this idea of painting a picture in that customer's mind you know uh, of what the solution would do for them and having them actually sign on the dotted line to spend money without actually seeing the product uh, other than in their own mind and i was i was pretty impressed at the time thought that was a, a pretty high achievement but ultimately over time their picture that is in their mind doesn't end up being the one you painted. They perceived it a little differently. And when you get into that deployment phase, you know, you start running into some challenges where their expectation was a lot different than the reality. And that kind of pushed us towards having to focus more on demos. So there wasn't that disconnect later that they kind of saw up front and what was going to be there and how that was going to work. I, I think that's also something that's more acute with SMB. You know, SMB you know, for the for, for you know, by and large, they don't have a real deep understanding of technologies or things like business solutions or what they may do. They, you know, they watch a couple of demo uh, videos or promotional videos from Microsoft, and they, I think, they get this sense sometimes that you know, I'm, I'm going to install this thing, push a couple of buttons, and it's going to revolutionize our whole business. And they don't really realize that there's an awful lot of work to make that happen, a lot of money to be spent. They can get frustrated very quickly. Which I think is uh, one of the reasons we're so excited about those upcoming SMB SKUs. And I know there's been lots of consternation in the partner community about what that means. You know, what are they going to take out? Are they going to handicap these SKUs, strip them down? Are they, is there going to be any partner opportunity around them? And, mm-hmm. uh, you know, we're, we're, we're heavily engaged with that team uh, about what that is. And I can't get into a lot of it. But I think that the goal of, uh, of what they're trying to do with that is – We've got enterprise SKUs right now, basically the same product we had before, which is you know, a complicated beast, uh, really, to get it to fit any customer's needs, much less a small one. And when you look at things like field service and project service, these are really too big for most SMB customers. So we just have not had a product at all that was suited 
for that customer. Up until now, we've been trying to dumb down a great big product to, to work for that customer. And there was expense in dumbing it down. I mean, customers, I mean, our, our whole rapid start model, customers literally paid us to strip out power. You know, be like taking your Ferrari right. to the dealer and paying them to replace the engine with a four cylinder, but at least you had something that was drivable. So <laughs> I, I, I'm very excited about what these SMB SKUs are going to bring. They're, yeah, are they going to be as extensible as the enterprise stuff? No, but they don't need to be. You've got enterprise SKUs for a customer that needs that. But there's still going to be partner opportunity around those SKUs. But I think for that SMB customer, those SKUs are going to be much closer to their expectation. And I think we've had challenges with that in the past where that customer's expectation is a lot different than what actually gets deployed with the enterprise stuff and what it's going to cost and take for them to get where they need to get. Eliminating features and eliminating power is necessary for success with that particular customer type, I think. The, the biggest question I have with, the, uh, with those business edition uh, sales and marketing apps is really if Microsoft knows what it's doing in terms of trying to compete with other CRM products in that segment because uh, there's a whole slew of them yep. uh, out there right that companies pretty much buy on their own I would guess I'm sure there's some co- firms that help you set up one of those smaller scale CRMs but do you think Microsoft's going to be able to have something that's competitive as a product in that space or is it going to be uh, up to the partners to to make it you know part of a bigger opportunity you know, I think that uh, you know even those uh, those simpler solutions out there that are you know end user configurable. You know, they don't do very much, and I think that's the challenge for Microsoft: is how can we provide something that does more? And you know, I mean, in the back of their mind, obviously they're thinking about partner opportunity, but they can't focus on partner opportunity first. The first thing is, what does this customer need that we can provide them that they would buy? Uh, and if there's partner opportunity, awesome, but. Uh, first thing is let's create a SKU that an end customer would buy. And I think that, you know, you can you can look at the other solutions out there. and There are tons of them, these little SMB-focused CRM cloud platforms that were built by, you know, who knows what, who knows where, that are charging, you know, 20 or $25 or something like that. And if Microsoft were to try and compete with that, I think it would be a mistake. Uh, kind of like with financials, if they were to try and compete head-to-head with QuickBooks, it would be a mistake. Yeah, they positioned financials as a product for the QuickBooks outgrower. They haven't positioned it as the product for the brand new startup business who's comparing it to QuickBooks. And I think that these apps will be similar. They're not really going to be comparing it uh, or competing head to head with those little, you know, I think the new Outlook customer manager uh, Mm -hmm. capability, which is not have anything to do with dynamics at all. It's part of the office 365 piece is more the answer to that group. But when you outgrow one of those little applications, I think this is that next step without having to step all the way to enterprise. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. It's sort of threading a needle a bit, but it sounds like you have some confidence in it from, from what you've seen so far that it, that it can stand out there in a certain segment. You know, I didn't when they first talked about it. (laughs) When they they first brought it up, I was pretty negative about the whole approach and what it was going to be. And I was, uh, you know, like a lot of partners who'd made a living on, you know, uh, selling SMB, the enterprise product, and working them through that. I was a little nervous about what they were going to do. But as I'm kind of seeing it unfold and kind of seeing some of what they actually are doing, yeah, it's going to be pretty awesome. I can hardly wait. I think from a pricing standpoint, there's going to be what uh, the, the financials, sales, service, marketing. Those four apps. Ultimately. Is there going to be a services business edition? Uh, they have talked a about customer, a service, service, customer service business. Edition. Yep, they've talked about that. It, it won't be uh, at least unless they catch it up. It won't be uh, launched when the sales and marketing are, uh, but it is. It is on the roadmap. So there's okay. going to be those. There's going to be those four apps, and they're going to be priced at forty dollars a piece. But for fifty dollars, you could get a plan that includes all of them. So I, I don't see anybody buying a, one of those apps. I mean, for you know, for fifty bucks. So when you think about that, for fifty dollars, you know, you're getting your sales, you're getting your customer service, you're getting your marketing, and you're getting your financials. That's a tough value for really. I can't think of anybody out there right now that that can compete with that particular breadth of yeah. services and capabilities. You know, these little CRM things you're talking about, you know, they're just doing one piece of that. Little marketing apps, they're just doing one piece. QuickBooks, just doing one piece. You know, these all these little 
things are all doing just this little one piece. If you added up those multiple pieces, you're going to come up more than 50 bucks. Oh, yeah, no question. I think uh, I keep coming back to the, the same point, though, that I'm not, you know, I'm not even really predicting, honestly, because obviously we'll have to, to wait and see. But this, the, the, this big challenge to me is this notion of giving the right segment of the market the right offering so that it's not you know zoho you know level crm there's something a little i think a little more sophisticated that pulls the best out of maybe what dynamic crm offers but doesn't like you said overload the customer you know but does kind of give that next level up to justify the price and not cause the person to think that they should be getting more for the price or less or expect less for the price i don't know to me there's like a fine balance that they really have to find where the the user interface is just right on and the set of capabilities is just right on at the right price to make it make sense, I think. That, that's the thing I'm, I'm watching for. Yeah, and I would say that uh, I think they're going to be pretty close from what I've seen with their initial launch, but certainly you know, I fully expect there'll be some, you know, once they hit the market with that, they're going to make some adjustments and fine-tune that. I think one of the advantages Microsoft has is right now they've got this huge, huge deployed base of Office 365 SMB customers, you know, and that and that continues to grow at a, at a pretty good clip in that SMB space. So, you know, when they're building these products, knowing that you know a, a significant proportion of them are going to be added to customers that already have Office 365, they've got Skype for Business, they've got SharePoint, they've got uh, OneDrive, they've got all these other features. You know, they're able to really link those things together like none of the other third parties could. So there's a you know there's a synergy there that's kind of created the the Dynamics uh, Business Edition apps will be even more valuable to someone who has Office 365 than if they didn't and I think that's going to be a big part of the conversation the future sales conversation with that SMB is oh you have Office 365 in that case let me show you what these can do because of that that really nobody else can even think about. And I'm thinking now in terms of things like the email analytics and some of those things that they launched recently uh, in the enterprise. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, the way they're able to, when they can connect Exchange Online to the Dynamics 365 database behind the scenes, you know, they can make a lot of pretty amazing things happen that some freestanding CRM solution sitting out there just can't do. Yeah, or when you can plug in certain you know, AI capabilities just by sort of toggling a configuration or something because they're pre-built to start reading certain signals or something like that. That's where it, it does get pretty interesting. Yeah, we'll see the, where, uh, we'll see how much of that gets into the SMB SKU because, as you mentioned, they do have to thread that needle, not, not just to provide enough value that uh, one of those other customers using another application would switch to it, but they can't provide so much value that they cannibalize the enterprise market. Yeah. You know, they need to make sure they've got some meat on the bone and plenty of it for people that, uh, you know, have more significant needs and are willing and should pay more that they will. So that's really the needle they have to thread. I think the bigger challenge for them with the SMB, with the business edition, when it's all fully deployed, is the, having the partners with the right background. You know, we've got, and as what you well know, you know, tons and tons of SMB-focused ERP partners. Uh, we've got lots of SMB-focused CRM partners. We don't have that many SMB-focused partners that wear both hats. Certainly in the enterprise space and larger customers, there are bigger partners that wear both hats. But in the SMB space, you mostly do one or the other. As a matter of fact, I was talking to the team recently about uh, different approaches that a a partner might take and how that sales and marketing together, you know, is going to be a pretty good story. You know, for an extra 10 bucks, you're getting sales and marketing you know, as part of that plan, and those two pieces together are pretty powerful. But with that plan, it's also dragging in with it financials. And for a CRM partner who's used to sales and marketing, and you know, that could be a little intimidating that the customer is going to see this financials that's coming in at the same price and and really being concerned about their ability to support, you know, the financials piece. And, uh, you know, just because something is easy for someone, say, who has a financial background doesn't mean it's easy for everyone, particularly someone who comes from the sales side. I myself come from a sales background, so I know CRM. I understand sales process, but I don't know anything about ERP. I don't know the first thing about it. I mean, you could show me the easiest ERP out there. and The challenge is I don't have the, the training or background in the base concepts. You know, I don't understand ERP 101. So I'm, I'm as lost as a customer might be. And I think it's probably it, it could very well be similar for those ERP partners. So we're 
We're, they're going to have to bridge that gap somehow. And I think shoving these products together is in a way going to kind of force that to happen. Yeah. Yeah. It also gets to the to complexity I, I was talking about earlier because finding the sort of the same level of, you know, the, the business edition financials is evolving rapidly right now too. I mean, it's out there, but it's sort of going to continue to change, I think is the way you might put it. You know, by the time, like I would say by the time the sales and marketing uh, SMB apps are, are ready, they'll be very close to something that looks a lot different with the business edition financials. I think they'll have updated a lot of the features. It'll still be there, but you know, they'll have updated features. They'll have updated kind of some a lot of the use cases, and you know, will they match up perfectly, sort of in harmony for uh, for these companies, like you said, who not only for the partners who have to sell it, but for the companies that would be the right fit for each one. Uh, yeah. That's a very interesting uh, challenge. Yeah, and you know, the financials app and the sales app do not look similar. Their interface is different. The way you customize them is different, and it would be great to see those things merge into a common. Uh, set of principles of, uh, you know, here's how they both look, here's how you navigate around them for a user standpoint, and that the development model behind them is the same for partners, but they're not. They're fundamentally different. Yeah. Uh, they're just being mushed together and sold as one, but they definitely are two different products. I know that, uh, you know, Marco Prisic, who runs that whole operation, he's focused now on getting feature parity with the full nav. Right. Because you hear that from, I hear that from ERP partners that I ask about, what are you thinking about financials? And they're like, well, you know, it shows a lot of promise. Customers are liking the idea, but it doesn't do this yet, or it doesn't do that yet. And we need this and we need that. So I think that uh, the focus right now on that product is getting feature parity with full nav so that mm -hmm. at least it can do everything. But I hope that they will, they will circle back at some point, because I know the you know, the SMB sales app is coming from the CRM side. So it's coming from that platform down. The marketing app is being built from the ground up. I actually had originally thought or heard or maybe started the rumor myself that that was coming, <laughs> <laughs> that that was coming from the Dynamics Marketing, the former marketing yeah. pilot app that they bought. And uh, that is not the case. It's definitely being built from the ground up as a, as a new application, which is great. Because, uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, Marketing Pilot wasn't even close. I was wondering how they would possibly get that to be an SMB solution. I thought it was somewhere in the middle because after after Marketing Pilot was, uh, you know, kind of acquired and had, they worked on it for a while, they started realizing all the other features they really wanted it to have. And those were built sort of from, you know, I, I don't know exactly where they were built, if they were lived in sort of the Marketing Pilot platform or if they lived in inside a CRM. but. I thought those are the same features that they've now moved over, the ones like the email marketing campaigns and things like that that are more sort of meat and potatoes, marketing, marketing automation or, you know, online marketing kind of capabilities that they might have started building there, but now they're just building them for the SMB. Yeah, I think that, uh, I don't know, maybe there was an earlier effort to think about Dynamics Marketing for Enterprise and, uh, you know, Adobe jumped up and said, hey, how about use us and we'll put our stuff at Azure. And there may yeah, been, yeah. There may have been a deal there, a little back scratch deal there, which is fine because it you know, gave Microsoft an enterprise marketing app that they could promote and then it just kind of turned their attention to the SMB. Uh, I think out of Marketing Pilot, what they did get was some UI elements. You know, some of the drag and drop process builder, some of that, mm -hmm. some of that UI, I think came came out of Dynamics Marketing. But mm -hmm. yeah, my understanding, from what I've seen on the marketing side, is uh, you know they may have stolen some some parts and pieces here and there, but it's it's pretty much being built, you know, from the ground yeah. up. And uh, I'm excited about that whole thing. As a matter of fact, yeah. we're we're strongly uh, considering moving away from the enterprise because right now our our solutions are built for the enterprise app, really to make them usable by SMB, but also uh, very often by enterprise as a way to get started. And uh, we're, we're thinking that when these things uh, launch, so we're going to be shifting our focus really just on that SMB piece. Plenty of enterprise partners to take care of enterprise customers and their sophisticated needs. But And, you know, when you read uh, all about Dynamics 365, you kind of get the sense that the market is very excited about complex things uh, and elaborate things and things like project services and things like, you know, the machine learning and some of those mm -hmm. things. And you sit back and you look at that through the lens of a typical SMB, and the, you know, mo most of them aren't going to need any of that or willing to pay for it or have it configured. So I think there is a 
there's not enough attention being paid right now on what the true SMB customer is going to want and need from a partner around these solutions. There's a lot of looking at shiny objects uh, and not a lot of, you know, the basic blocking and tackling looking at that SMB. So, you know, we're thinking about, you know, really focusing almost exclusively on that. You know, I, I've been a big fan in the past of looking at uh, the hole where partners aren't at and then going and standing in that hole and either finding out why none of them were there <laughs> or being the first one there. And right now, the hole that I see potentially is around that SMB customer just selling them what it is they want and need uh, and not going into that SMB customer and, and trying to dazzle them with, you know, a bunch of crazy analytics or, or, or things that are just going to be foreign to them and, and frankly, make the, mm -hmm. make the sale difficult. I have definitely seen partners in the past talk an SMB customer into and right out of a sale in the same conversation. <laughs> they, they didn't know when to stop talking, you know. You get them excited and then scare the pants off them. Yeah, the exactly. Yeah, you, you, you talk about a few things and they're ready. They, I love it. I'm ready to sign. And then you say, oh, and, and it'll also and go on to three or four more things. <laughs> and, and the next thing you know, the customers decided, okay, I don't understand. I'm, I'm leaving. So. That reminds me of some politicians. It's like they say a few things like, oh, that makes sense. That's and then they keep going. You're like, oh, okay, wow, this is not my. This is not what I was looking for <laughs> at all. Yep. Um, so one of the things my dad, my dad taught me yeah. when I was a kid in sales because uh, he was a he was a salesman when I was a kid. He said, as soon as they say yes, shut up and leave. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've had I've had. Um, you know, I'm not a natural salesperson, but people I know who are good salespeople, you know, something along the same lines of, you know, don't give up too much more information than you really need to, you know. Yeah, you know, and that kind of circles it, back to your, your earlier comment about demos, because you see that in demos all the time, too. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, and, and Microsoft partners that do demos of Dynamics are so keen to want to show all of these really cool, neat uh, features, many in previews, some of which may not even be functioning quite right yet. And uh, with that SMB customer, the, the customer just says, so so where do I put contacts in this system? You know, they, they kind of glossed over the, yeah. the, the base. After 30 minutes of demo, they come back to that. Yeah. That question. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I had a recent experience where a demo was given to me. I got, I got a call from a company about an ISV solution that uh, they wanted to talk to us uh, initially about selling it just to us. And I said, well, yeah, that might be something that we could talk about, you know, incorporating into our rapid start and sell through our, you know, 300 global resellers uh, and it'd be a much larger footprint. Oh, yeah, well, let me get you, uh, connect you up. And this was just a telesales guy. Let me connect you up with a senior guy. And uh, you know, the next thing I got was an email from some other person about wanting to do a demo of their product. And, you know, the time came and I, I, I logged in for this demo. She had no idea what I was talking about, any background of any conversation or what this potential opportunity for them was. Right. And just proceeded to sh press play on the side of her head and show me this demo. And I just thought, you know what? What a complete missed opportunity. You know, just. Yeah. And I think that there's a lot of that in sales with demos that, you know, we're going we're gonna to have Bob over there who does nothing but demos do your demo. Well, in order for him to demo it to me, doesn't he need to know what I'm interested in seeing? Or is he just going to show me whatever the hell he wants to show me? And I, I think there's a big miss there. Yeah, for sure. I mean, well, you know, and, and a lot of that's not a technology problem, right? It's a um, – certainly technology could maybe help with, some, with that. To some extent, it's, it's, a, it's a laziness. It's a laziness. Uh, yeah, management or laziness. Yeah, yeah. Just, just laziness. It's a, you know, one of the things that's piqued my interest lately is this idea – which I guess isn't necessarily new, but seems to be getting some renewed attention of this account-based marketing. You know, we've been we've been looking here, and you know, partners and everybody. You know, we've all been working towards this idea of I need to get my message out through social channels to everybody in the world, as many people as I can blast my message out to, and I need to have hundreds of thousands of leads and working through these hundreds of thousands of leads, trying to surface them up into opportunities. And you know, that's been that's been going on for a while now. Microsoft yeah. has pushed this motion. There's lots of, uh, you know, social media in general has pushed this motion. And I think that part of it is because it's free. I mean, you can send out a tweet, doesn't cost you a dime. And, you know, email marketing generally is, is pretty inexpensive to blast a bunch of spam to a bunch of people. But if you, were, if you actually had to pay for all that stuff, I think you probably wouldn't see nearly as much of it. But I think that combined with this idea of really focusing on industries, 
which I had been skeptical of also, you know, when Microsoft first started floating that around to partners that, you know, you really need to be focused on some verticals. You know, pick a couple of verticals that you're good at and really build a practice around those. And standing back, you think logically, yeah, that would make sense if that's what I started as. But, you know, I do things for everybody. So from where I'm at now, the only way for me to focus on a vertical would be to stop working for all these other deals. And I'm not ready to let them go. And I think there's been some inertia there of people wanting to continue to be all things to all customers that's flying in the face of being vertical. Mm -hmm. But when you look at what's happening to the solutions... They're getting simpler to deploy. I won't say the need for a partner is not strong, but it certainly is diminished and is getting more diminished. You got to look for ways as a partner that you're going to make, you know, make money. Uh, lots of things we used to have, customers used to pay us for don't even need to be done at all anymore, uh, or customers can do it themselves. So you got to bring something to the table other than, hey, I'm a Microsoft partner. Uh, and vertical expertise, I think, is probably the spot it's going to be. So if you think about verticals, then suddenly this big blast my message to the world social media approach, you know, is a real scattergun uh, way of trying to track that vertical. You know, and it's this account-based marketing idea, and there's a guy named Alex Sesums uh, with Microsoft who's written a whole series on it as well, and there's, there's several consultants out there who are really, instead of focusing on this vague marketplace, you know, you're, you're identifying, you know, target customers that fit this niche you're going after, this vertical and then learning more about them, you know, you're not just sending them, and for, even Microsoft's guilty of this, uh, instead of just sending them a generic message, maybe with a couple of buzzwords in it about their industry, you're really, before you even make contact with this potential prospect, you're trying to learn enough about them that when you first do make contact, you're going to be successful. You know, you know that they just bought some company, or you know what's happening in their industry, or you know you, you know enough about them that when you first approach them with your initial contact, it doesn't sound like a recorded message, mm -hmm. um, and you get a higher response rate. And I, I think that, combined with vertical, is going to be an interesting tack for partners to look at uh, moving forward, is thinking about going vertical in some niches that they've got some domain expertise in. Uh, and that's the biggest challenge with vertical is... I can sit back and think all day about great verticals, but I don't have any domain expertise in, in that particular vertical. So you got to get that from somewhere. But And then once you've got that, really a more targeted approach that, you know, of that vertical, who would be good customers? Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Let me identify the customer first instead of just a list of a thousand of them. You know, let me find out of that list of a thousand, let me find 20 of them that I actually would want if they called me, you know, and then, right. and then really go after those 20 in a much more meaningful, a uh, lot more effort than what I see out there in, in most marketing today, which is just a low touch, low effort and playing a numbers game. Yeah, that, that I, I can see what you mean there. It's like if you showed a thousand companies this really great feature or, you know, add on capability you've developed, it'll knock the socks off of maybe these 20 and the rest of them would think it was maybe nice but not uh not really see the value in it because it was so so geared toward this vertical it sounds like part of it is finding those 20 that you're talking about who are going to hear what you're saying if you have that expertise well and out of all those ones that that didn't respond uh very often it isn't necessarily what you had it's it's the way you tried to approach them uh in such a generic spammy way that they get a pro i mean I mean, I, I, yeah. we both, I'm sure you get 100 emails a day. And I just delete, 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 delete. I don't read past the subject line. There's nothing Yeah. There's nothing compelling me to want to dig further. And I could very well be skipping past a bunch of stuff that could be very valuable to me. But they didn't get, they didn't know enough about me in that initial contact to make me want to read any further. Um, yeah. Your eyes ability, or maybe your brain's ability to sort of immediately get, take a read on these, on, you know, on, contacts that come in, communications that come in, and whether they seem legit or not. There's sort of a psychological element there too. And I think perhaps the account-based approach gets beyond that by forcing you to be a little more thoughtful in your communications. Yeah. I mean, in the old days, it was a big deal to have an email actually say, dear, and insert that person's name instead of, <laughs> you know, instead of dear prospect or something. And then it would suddenly insert that person's name. We all thought that was great. But now the bar, I think, is much higher than just inserting person's name. Like yeah. you say, you scan that message, you see, I see, you know, dear Steve, 
you know, in about one sentence down, I'm realizing that this is this is just a broadcast generic message about something I'm probably not interested in. Yeah. But if yeah. that if that second sentence had said something like, you know, I, I noticed that Forceworks had just relocated to new headquarter, you know, something that was real and, and connected with, the, I probably would read further. But they would have yeah. to have done some research on me to know enough to be able to say something like that. Uh, and at the end of the day, what's the point of sending out all those messages if nobody responds? You know, uh, spend yeah, yeah. spend more effort in a message that someone would respond to that's targeted to them, and then don't worry about being so broad with it. We'll see. We'll see. I, I like the idea. Well, let me ask you one more thing about that. Come, kind of takes it back to your own business because I, I think I sent, I got a sense of this reading something. So, what what's the role of? Is there a role for that that approach or, or sort of verticalized you know practitioners out there when it comes to something like Rapid Start CRM, either with add-ons or with I don't know other kinds of vertical focus that relates back to what you guys are all about? Well, we hope so. You know, we're I could tell you that the ingredients are still in the mixing bowl on these SKUs. They are not baked yet. In conversations I've had, the kinds of questions they're asking me tell me that they are still making some big decisions about those SKUs. So we don't know exactly how they're going to land, uh, but I can I can tell you right now that these things are not already built, ready to go, all decisions made uh, yet. So uh, And you're talking about the business edition yep, talking apps. about the business edition apps. Yeah, those, those ingredients are still being mixed and, and uh, put into the bowl. So when we see how that lands, well, then we'll find out. You know, I mean, we built Rapid Start specifically to take an enterprise product and knock it down for an SMB use. Well, that's exactly what Microsoft's trying to solve with this SMB apps. So I definitely expect that we're going to pivot from what we were doing uh, into something else. And, it's, and particularly given that I said earlier, we're really looking to focus on that SMB Mm-hmm. And I think circling it back to that verticalization, I think that's going to be the space for us is, uh, you know, maybe our product evolves from, you know, just getting a small customer to be able to use a big product uh, in some fashion, instead allowing them to use a small product in a much more specific fashion uh, for their vertical. Okay. So sim- similar concept to the way we do it today, yeah. just a little different, a different angle and slant. And I thought you had told me sometime when we had talked in the past that there's actually one of the less expected uses of Rapid Start was that maybe bigger teams that still needed to get everything stripped down were finding value from it. Is that still a line of uh, or yeah, one way that it's being used? We're seeing in, in larger organizations, we're seeing it, it used as a proof of concept tool. Uh, okay. Because, you know, when you're looking at a big company who maybe they're on Salesforce or or some other uh, large ERP our CRM system, and we're looking at uh, dynamics, you know, they they really just want to take it out for a test drive and just get a feel for it. And that's kind of hard to do with, you know, here, here's the fully loaded application, you know, take it for a spin for the weekend. So our application has been used to kind of simplify that experience so that they can actually take it for a spin for the weekend and get a successful result. And it has been used for actual deployments in large cases where the person at the company who's responsible for getting CRM deployed uh, had a bad experience before. Uh, They could very well have spent, you know, well into six figures on developing a CRM deployment that never gained adoption. And, you know, in these business applications, more than anything else, I mean, it's easy to adopt email. Everybody adopts email. But if you can't get adoption of these business solutions, you've got nothing. And with some of those larger customers with a person in charge like that, they've gone through that experience in the past and and they've used our tool where they've decided, you know what, I want adoption first. Once I get adoption, then we'll spend all the money and we'll do all these other things, but I'm not doing it the other way around anymore. I'm not going to spend six figures and then try and get adoption. Uh, I want to spend very little, get adoption first, and then we'll build on that. So we're still going to have our product available for, you know, the enterprise SKUs uh, and for those, uh, those circumstances. I'm more thinking about a variation that would be targeted strictly for the business edition. I think that's something else for folks that are out there thinking about AppSource uh, to think about is, you know, ultimately we're going to have enterprise sales, take for example, enterprise sales app and business edition sales app. While they both may be built on the same, you know, underpinnings, there's going to be less features and less capabilities in that SMB app by design and necessity. Yeah. So it could very well be that an app that you've built for AppSource 
to work on the enterprise SKU uh, might not function on the SMB SKU. It may not have all the all the pieces that are required for your piece to operate. And I think one of the things we're going to see once that launches is uh, apps in App Source that have been certified for enterprise or business edition or both. So right. that's something people need to think about because the last thing Microsoft want, will want is someone with a new business edition app uh, going to try and download something from App Source that just plain will not run on it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and having a bad experience. So that's something else for both AppSource and the Dynamics team to figure out before this launches. Oh, yeah, I think the, that's a must. Huh? Yeah, <laughs> is, is how, how to keep that tra- traffic jam uh, from happening. But I think a lot of the AppSource developers could find themselves a little flat-footed also if they're not thinking a little bit in advance about, you know, let me make sure. And I, and I know that's challenging to do because you don't know yet. But once it's in public preview, I think that that's going to be something these guys that are working on apps are going to need to jump on real quick is let me make sure this thing will still work on the business edition. If not, you know, let me create a version of it that will so they right. don't get left behind because Microsoft is going to want to launch those uh, business edition apps with plenty of app source apps available. They're not going to want to have nothing in the store that will go on those apps. So that'll be another yeah, mad absolutely. scramble. There's going to be sort of a base set of the most popular types of add-ons, you know, e-signatures, CPQ, process, uh, you know, social, all these things that. And when you, you look know, at some of those, right there. And when you look at some of those solution files, they they often touch a lot of things uh, in CRM. Okay. Uh, so it's going to be: Are all those things going to exist in the business edition? And you know, you're going to have to learn to kind of lighten your footprint. Yeah, yeah. I mean, one one of the big ones to me is: Do I want to buy a marketing app from Microsoft, or do I want to just use a real marketing automation solution that I know has five years in its pocket of good R and D behind it? Right. You know, I heard that. Or, or I heard that like recently. That. I think it might have been on your last podcast. That I, that <laughs> I, 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 I think maybe the BDO guy was uh, mentioning something about that. You know, thinking about like ah, click okay. dimensions. Click Dimensions as an example of a company that is built. But, uh, you know, Click Dimensions is also a good example of an app that, you know, is going to need to make sure it'll run on the business edition sure. version because sure. it, it has a pretty big footprint. And I'm not saying it will or won't. That's just something they'll need to make sure of. And then they're going to find themselves competing in the in the business edition space with the Microsoft marketing offering. And from what I've seen of the Microsoft marketing offering, there is an awful lot of parity between those products. Yes, Click Dimensions has a track record and has experience, but I think that Microsoft's going to be able to price more aggressively. And there'll be lots of SMB customers in particular that'll, I don't look for a reason why I should spend more. I look for a reason why I should spend right. less or why I shouldn't spend less rather and you know that could be an interesting little play. You know, I think the same thing with portals. And I don't even know whether they're going to have their portal solution available for the business edition or not. Yeah, that, I don't know. That, that's an enormous solution. And even in enterprise, when I look at something like what Microsoft has launched for portals versus something like Peak Portals, which you know Peak Portals is a third-party solution, builds a nice portal. Portal Connector is another third-party portal solution. They both. Yep. They kind of approach it completely differently. But uh, when I look at what Microsoft's portal solution is, that's a fat solution for a fat enterprise. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. So, so I think that, yeah, we'll see if they come out with a thinner version of portals for the business edition, but they'd have a lot to do to do that. Yeah, I was amazed that two or three different portal vendors stepped up after or right around the time that ADX Studios IP was acquired by Microsoft. And I remember thinking, boy, did these people just get unlucky with the timing or do they know something? And I think I think they've actually knew something that, like maybe to your point, that there is a good segment of people that just were, the, the, the portals from Microsoft is just too much or it's not the right fit for their kind of company or their kind of organization. So who knows, you know, maybe those I, I, I think those were, I think they were... I think they're betting on Microsoft to miss the mark, you know, which is not a bad yeah. bet. Microsoft historically is uh, sometimes does miss the mark the first try or two and takes them a few tries to get to it. But I know both of the guys that run those two portals, you know, very well. Okay. And both of them, you know, certainly were concerned when Microsoft bought ADX. They were concerned about what it was going to be priced, how it was going to be priced. You know, then here it comes out and, you know, it's like included in the plan and, you know, it's pretty inexpensive. uh, And so that would get you a little nervous if you're trying to charge for something. But, you know, just installing something like the partner portal, the -the out-of-the-box partner portal, you know, it throws on a 25 or 30 custom solution. It's an enormous 
a heavy, heavy application, tough to configure for someone who doesn't know it very well. Uh, and I think that uh, both of those uh, portal players are seeing an opportunity here for, yeah, Microsoft went big on that and they've left lots of space underneath. Not the yeah. case, not the case in the click dimensions. I mean, I think Microsoft is going straight after that level of customer with a product aimed at that level of customer because they're building it. But yeah, on the portal side, I think the guys that have got the lighter portal solution still see a spot. Click dimensions will be interesting to see how that shakes out. Yeah, it's pretty much the lone sort of dynamics-focused marketing automation player still there. Uh, yeah, I, I agree. Um, they have a, a lot of a lot of time and a lot of awareness among the existing channel. But yeah, we well, we shall from see. From an integrated it, standpoint, you know, we've got there's third parties, Marketo, and there's some other third party yeah, external that, that will that, that will integrate. But from a yeah, from a fully integrated native native product. It'll be interesting to see. Interesting timing on the sale of Click Dimensions, also, you know. So yeah, and getting back to the portals, I would be. Uh, I keep watching to see them sort of push that more heavily too. I guess if I wanted to make a prediction for for the next year, I would imagine I'd be very interested to see a bigger push on the promise of portals. Even if it's just we're talking about enterprise again, I think that has so much potential for their vertical push and for just the possibilities that it can bring. Yeah, portals in general have become a much hotter topic. You know, recently, even in the SMB customers, you know, they, you know, and I think some of that's tied to the millennials coming in uh, into the workforce in business uh, decision making positions. You know, I mean, it used to be that if you didn't have that 800 number, you know, you, you weren't going to do any business. And, you know, guys my age, you know, we had that attitude that, you know, if I can't talk to a live person, I'm not buying from that company and I'm looking for that 800 number. Yeah, these millennials are coming in. They're kind of like, if I have to talk to a live person, I'm not buying from that company. They have kind of like an opposite attitude. Uh -huh. uh, they don't have any interest in calling an 800 number and talking to somebody and being sold. They want to log in somewhere, find out about the product on their own, and then interact with you on their phone or on a web without having to. They, they don't want to talk to you. Mm -hmm. And I think that uh, that's driving a lot of interest in portals. And I don't think that's going to go away. I think it's going to be almost an automatic in the near future that when you deploy these solutions, the portal just gets deployed. I think what we're going to see more of is cannibalizing other portal things that are sitting out there, like some web shopping cart independent solution that somebody has that instead, you know, it's uh, being brought into a portal connected to their business solutions mm -hmm. instead of sitting out there siloed. But yeah, the interest is definitely there. I think the Microsoft solution is great for the big ones. Right. Uh, and we've got a couple third party for the small ones. And I think that I'd like to invest in a portal business right now. I think there's, there's lots of runway for those guys. <laughs> Portals integrate. We haven't even touched on integration, but I think that's the, <laughs> maybe that's for next time. But yeah, thanks again. Always interesting. I'm definitely going to keep watching your blog, stevemordu.com, right? Yeah. And congratulations again on the MVP award. Well deserved. And, you know, lots more to come, I'm sure. Thanks, Jason. Look forward to talking to you next time. Thanks for listening to the MSDW podcast. If you'd like to be on the podcast or have a comment, drop us a line. Again, I'm Jason Gumpert. You can reach me by email at jgumpert at msdynamicsworld.com. Until next time, this is MS Dynamics World signing off. Oh!